Now, please join me in welcoming founder and managing partner of Stevenson Aquisto and Coleman, Joyce Stevenson Laws. Thank you, Brittany. Good, good day, everyone. And welcome to yet another SAC seminar. I'm sure you know that we would have preferred to do this in the seminar in person, but after much deliberation, I think we chose the safest route possible to deliver this information because we know that there's still more work to do as it relates to COVID. Now, so we're back on Zoom, but we hope to see you in person at the next seminar. The goal of these seminars is to create a better awareness about how you can increase the likelihood of reimbursement for medically necessary services that you render to patients. For example, in the past, we have discussed how you can negotiate better contracts, legislative interventions, and court action, or internal changes you can make at your own hospital. Now, today we will be talking about a tool that we can use when payers refuse to respond to your inquiries about claims, give you no real reason for not paying your claims, refuse to return your phone call, lose your claims or supporting documents, deny you treatment, your treatments as experimental and not medically necessary, say your claim is untimely, say you charge too much for your services, like $5,000 for an aspirin, and I could go on. There's so many reasons why payers refuse to pay your claims. And if, you're, if, if you think your claim should be paid, then arbitration, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, is one aspect that we, or one tool that we can use as an option to get your claims paid. Now, I know some people are intimidated about court actions, the settings, the length of time it takes to get the case resolved. The good news is that arbitration is not as formal as court action, and there are ways to reduce the length of time it takes to resolve a case. And we have enjoyed lots of success here in, in, in arbitration at SAC. We have even recovered interest on claims where payments have been delayed. So today, not only are we going to try and educate you about the arbitration process, we're even going to do a mock arbitration so that you can experience the process and the type of issues that we address there. It's our opinion that valid claims should not be written off. Arbitration is the one option to be used to obtain reimbursement for medically and necessary services that you, you render to patients. It's one of the options. So with that in mind, I will now throw this over to Chuck who will explain a little bit more about arbitration and don't forget your Uber Eats voucher. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank Joy uh, for that kind introduction and sort of uh, setting the table for what we are going to be doing today. Welcome. Uh, as Joy had said, I'm Chuck Aquisto, a senior partner with Stevenson Aquisto and Coleman. And we're more than happy to present to you the very first mark arbitration of its kind. And the genesis behind this, as Joy had mentioned, is that we always have a fear of the unknown. Well, we know a lot about how the courtroom works because we see it all the time. In movies, A Few Good Men, The Verdict, or My Cousin Vinny are perfect examples of courtroom uh, dramas and or comedies. And television is littered with TV shows that have shown countless hours in the courtroom. But arbitration is unique because arbitration happens behind closed doors. So we are not really sure what goes on behind those closed doors. Today, we're gonna allow that door to open so you can have a little bit of a glimpse, a condensed glimpse of what occurs in an arbitration. So how do we get to arbitration uh, in the healthcare world? Well, it all starts with the dispute and that dispute might be over a claim not being paid or not being re reimbursed, medical necessity, lots of different issues. We as Stevenson, Aquisto and Coleman often can take the claim and we will work it in what we call our pre-litigation area. And that is going through a process. And the process is dictated most of the times by a contract. In most contracts in the business world, there is going to be a provision in the contract called a dispute resolution provision. In that provision, it will outline how to settle the dispute. In many managed care contracts, that dispute process is arbitration. This was really at the uh, direction of many of the payers 
because one of the great aspects of arbitration is there isn't really case law. So prior to getting to that, there is usually a step-by-step -step process, an appeals process that must be exhausted. If that process is not exhausted and you were to go and try to move it to arbitration, just like on a board game, you could be sent back to the beginning and they will make sure that you do follow the correct steps. Once we have gone through the appeals process, if we are still not successful in trying to resolve that payment dispute, the next step could be an informal meet and confer. We want to make good faith efforts to try to get it resolved without it having to get to that legal process of litigation. However, if that is not successful with the payers, we then turn to the next part, which is the arbitration, which is how do we get to that uh, venue and that um, uh, so we can resolve that dispute. As a law firm, we want to make sure that the hospital is going to have the best outcome with this particular dispute. We would like to try to put as many of the disputed claims with the same payer into a grouping because if we can put multiple claims together, that will provide the hospital with more leverage in the arbitration, in particular, if it comes to some negotiations. When we are grouping these, we will then have a value of what that particular arbitration is going to be. The value will be what is the outstanding balances for the claim or claims. It is possible that you could have one very large claim that necessitates that it just moves into arbitration itself. However, many times we would like to take smaller claims and group them with some of the larger claims. And this is usually because it's an issue with the exact same payer. Once we have done that, we will also then prepare for you our own summary of that particular case to provide to the hospital so that they can review to make the determination whether to move the matter into arbitration. Remember, it is always the hospital's decision whether to go to arbitration or not. In those particular instances, we will also give our own evaluation and valuation to the case based upon many of the arbitrations we've already conducted, in particular with that payer and similar contracts. So we will let the hospital know what is the expected outcome if we were to move this all the way to arbitration. If, the, if it is approved to move to arbitration, the next step was that we will have to file with the appropriate entity that handles the arbitration. And there are multiple companies that do that. These are private companies. These are not run by the county or the state or the federal government. So these private entities require a filing fee. And this is uh, so that we can make sure that we are in the queue to have the arbitration heard, but it's also said so that arbitrations are just not used as a, a tool to try to get a result. Unfortunately, more and more of these cases do go to arbitration. In addition to a filing fee, there is also a deposit fee that is required, and this is for the arbitrators themselves. We'll learn a little bit more about this as we walk through the actual arbitration process. So I'm very excited that we are gonna get ready to present the very first mock arbitration, but to provide a little bit more about what's gonna happen as we lead up to that arbitration once it's been filed, I'm gonna turn it over now to Barbara Lamb, a senior attorney in our Northern California office. Hi everyone. Thank you, Chuck, for that um, introduction. Well, again, my name is Barbara Lamb, and I'm one of the um, attorneys at Stevenson, Aquisto, and Coleman, and I'm out of the Northern California office. Um, today, I will go over just some highlights of an arbitration process to give you some idea. Um, so, like Chuck said, arbitration gets started when a demand is filed, and uh, we we will file that demand on behalf of the hospital against the health plan. And that's how the arbitration process will start. Um, about 45 days or so after that filing, uh, the attorney for the plan will um, 
file its pleading, its uh, responsive papers. And then uh, roughly, I would say about a 30 to 45 days after that, the attorneys for the hospital and the attorneys for the plan will get together and coordinate to select an arbitrator. Now, some of your contracts will require that three arbitrators um, are required for um, to arbitrate uh, a matter regardless of the price. And um, if your contracts still have such um, language, I would highly suggest that you talk to your contracting department to see if they can negotiate that language out of their you know, con new contract, any upcoming um, contract negotiations. Um, that is because the arbitrator's cost, like Chuck was saying, that deposit, um, range between 50 to about $65,000. Um, and so if, you have, if you're required to have three arbitrators to arbitrate a case that's maybe worth um, you know, 100 and something, um, it may not justify having a three arbitrator panel, but because of the contract, um, we're stuck with having a three arbitrator panel. And in addition to that, um, trying to coordinate with um, three plus um, different people um, are quite challenging. So if, um, if at all possible, you have such language in your contract still, um, talk to your contracting department and see if that, can, that language can be negotiated out. So once an arbitrator has been selected, um, soon after, that arbitrator will have a preliminary conference where the attorneys from the health plan as well as the hospital get together um, and the arbitrator will select a the scheduling uh, will select the arbitration date as well as um, setting different various deadlines and one of the deadlines um, is the production of documents um, this is a very uh, important deadline, and it's, um, it's an opportunity for the hospital to produce documents that support its claim for the underpayment. For example, um, if you know you have a trauma claim where the plan failed to properly pay it because they claim it wasn't trauma um, related or didn't satisfy the the trauma criteria, um, it's really crucial that not only do we, uh, that we have the medical records, but we also have the trauma flow sheets or a timeline indicating when the trauma team appeared, uh, when the trauma surgeon um, evaluated the patient. Um, so it's very, you know, that that is a crucial um, additional um, document that we would need in addition to just the regular medical records. Or if we have a, um, a denial for emergency care where they pay for the emergency portion, but the additional days were not paid because they said it was, uh, there was no authorization. Um, case management notes, uh, utilization team notes are very crucial. And if they are saved somewhere apart from the regular um, set of medical records, it's important that um, we are able to receive that from the hospital so then we can produce it to uh, the healthcare plan so then that at the arbitration, we will have those documents to support the hospital's demand for the, uh, the underpayment. Um, another deadline that the arbitrator will set is a deadline to designate witnesses. And these are witnesses that the hospital would want to, to designate to be able to testify at the arbitration. And um, in all cases, we would wish to have the hospital designate someone that is familiar with the provisions language of the contract um, of the health plan that's being sued. Um, Provisions such as the um, when how many days um, does the hospital have to bill a claim, how many levels of appeals, um, the rates for that reimbursement um, for that particular uh, level of care. So, um, so in addition to the contracts, um, the hospital's witness would also need to be familiar with um, the computer notes how to read it, how to interpret it, because at the arbitration, 
that witness will help the arbitrator in terms of um, how to follow through and read the, um, the hospital's computer notes to establish that the, the claim was timely filed or an appeal was uh, submitted and done and, and uh, recorded um, in the computer notes. Um, and another deadline that an arbitrator will set is the um, cancellation deadline. So um, arbitra the arbitrators will set that particular deadline, and if the parties are able to come together and settle the matter before that cancellation deadline, um, then most of that deposit, the $50,000, $16,000 deposit, the hospital would be able to recover if the settlement can happen before that uh, cancellation deadline. So um, after the preliminary hearings, the, those deadlines are set. Um, as, as we continue to review and prepare for the arbitration, as we get closer to the arbitration, we will set a, um, a meeting time where we will um, request to meet with the hospital's designated witnesses, and if it's a non-clinical uh, witness, we would go over the computer notes, go over the, the reason for the denials, um, go over with the witness the questions that uh, may be asked, um, as well as anticipating any questions that the health plan attorneys may cross and ask the witness. So, you know, we'll definitely um, set aside time to prepare the hospital's witness. And if it involves a clinical um, denial issue, then um, we would have already requested and obtained uh, permission to either have the hospital designate one of their doctors or a case management nurse or go and retain an outside medical director or medical expert to testify on those clinical um, issues. Um, and then, you know, we will proceed and, um, to the arbitration. And at the arbitration, it's, it's like a trial, what you would see, um, not as what you would see um, on TV, but it, it's mostly done in a conference setting where the hospital side will sit on one side and the plans will, um, folks will sit across um, the table on the other side and the arbitrator will be at the head of the table. The testimony will be done um, sometimes by Zoom, especially now it is all done by Zoom. The, um, and sometimes there is a court reporter there to, um, to take, care, um, you know, take down everything. And then once the arbitration um, hearing is done, then uh, the arbitrator takes about 30 to 45 days to, um, after the closing of the arbitration and both sides' attorneys submit their briefs, the arbitrator will set will submit his or her arbitration ruling. So um, that's pretty much the general highlights and aspects of an arbitration process. Um, now I would say we'll turn it over to Rich Levich where, where we'll start their, the mock arbitration for you to see. Thank you, Your Honor. Making my appearance, Rich Lovich, co-managing partner at, at Stevenson and Quisto and Coleman, and I'm representing Gotham Hospital. You wanted appearances from counsel, right? Yes, we're going to get started. Um, so now we're on the record. Um, this is the matter of Gotham Hospital versus SFG Health Plan. Um, thank you, Mr. Levich. And um, counsel for um, Health Plan, can you make your appearance, please? Yes, good morning, Your Honor. Christopher Haypack. Uh, I'm a partner, Stevenson, Aquisto, and Coleman, but for purposes of today's exercise, I am the attorney for SFG Health Plan. Great. G good, uh, good day, counsel. Um, before we get started, um, do you have, are there any preliminary issues um, that you would like to raise? I have none, Your Honor. Thank you. Nothing from respondent. Okay. And are you ready for your opening statement? Yes, thank you. Okay, Mr. Levich. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning and good morning, counsel. This case presents an interesting story. It's somewhat different than some of the usual cases Your Honor may have heard in the past. 
regarding insurance companies versus healthcare providers. This particular case presents a conflict between the exercise of medical judgment in an area where there was not a well-defined treatment path, coming up against an insurance company's internal reimbursement policies that if allowed to stand would result in the hospital not receiving compensation. Just as a bit of background, and I'm sure you know this, Your Honor, having lived in the community for a long time, Gotham Hospital is a pillar of the healthcare delivery system in our community. It's been around for 100 years and is one of the most important aspects of the safety net of healthcare provision in our community for that period of time. It always puts patient care above any other consideration. And in order to continue its high quality of work, it's absolutely necessary that they receive compensation for the services that they provide. As you know, the hospital includes a trauma center, a cancer unit, a transplant unit, and a research facility. All of these are absolutely essential for the community to provide adequate health care to, to, to the people that, that uh, live here. Let me tell you a little bit about this particular case, Your Honor. It involves a 65-year-old patient. His name is Charles Allnut. He suffered an unfortunate fall at home and was brought to the emergency room at Gotham Hospital. He was diagnosed as needing on an emergency basis a complete hip replacement. Now, his history is important here. Um, he has a history of atrial fibrillation, which as your honor probably knows means an irregular heartbeat and also involves a heightened threat of stroke. So in order to treat Mr. Allnut, it was necessary to use a blood thinning agent or what's known in the medical community as an anticoagulant in order to thin the blood to decrease the chance of stroke while Mr. Allnut was being treated. The blood thinner that was used is called Eliquis. And again, it was used to reduce the possibility of stroke in the patient during the, during the surgery. As a result of the surgery, however, there was some major bleeding that, that was caused uh, during the surgery. Bleeding to the extent that as Dr. Zarati, the hospital's medical expert will testify, um, was a major bleed, as they say in the, in, the, in the industry. It was 10 units of hemoglobin that was lost as a, as a result of the surgery. What that did is it gave rise to a need for an antidote to the blood thinning properties of Eliquis. Unfortunately, in the medical community, there was not a recognized FDA approved treatment plan to counteract the blood thinning impact of the drug. The treating physician here was a board certified hematologist. Facing a situation where there was not a, a well recognized treat, treatment plan, he had to rely upon his medical judgment in treating the patient. So just to set the stage, we've got a patient with a history of, of uh, atrial fibrillation, which could lead to stroke, requiring a blood thinner. Because of the surgery, he had a lot of loss of blood, so they had to counter the blood thinning aspect of the drug. There was no recognized way of doing that, so that our board certified hematologist identified a drug, a very high cost drug um, called Factor 7A. That was an FDA approved drug. It, it, it included a package insert that our board certified hematologist relied upon in his treatment plan for the patient. He was faced with a situation that if adequate treatment was not provided, on an emergency basis, the patient was facing at least the loss of his leg and at most the loss of his life. So the doctor had to make a decision, again, based upon his medical training and experience. The packet insert that he used, <clears throat> which were instructions from the manufacturer of the drug, indicated a treatment course of 12 administrations of the drug. Our board certified hematologist followed those instructions completely. 
as the evidence will show. And as a result of him doing that, the patient came through successfully, which is always the goal of the treater and the, and the hospital. Now, the, as I said, this was a high cost drug and it was a very high cost drug. These 12 administrations that were called for in the packet insert resulted in an invoice amount of $1.4 million. Nothing was paid by SFG Health Plan, which was Mr. Allnut's health plan, with regard to the high cost drugs. A small amount was paid with regard to the general facility charges. So the, the issue here is the basis for the denial by SFG Health. They pointed to their operations manual, a document that they are that the evidence will show they are in complete control of, both in terms of when it is amended, both it, with regard to the base language that is used and with regard to any language that is used in, its, in the operations manual. No input is sought and no input is received from any provider with regard to the content of the operations manual, nor with regard to the language used in the operations manual. SFG came to the conclusion that because the manner in which the antidote was used, the factor 7A antidote was used, because that use was not FDA approved, even though the drug itself was FDA approved, that they had the ability to deny payment for the high cost drug, characterizing it as experimental or investigational. So under the contract between the parties, if a drug is experimental or investigational, it is not medically necessary and therefore is not reimbursable. The evidence will show that the use of the drug and the manner in which it was used is not the issue here. And with your honor's permission, I would like to pull up a document, which is the operations manual text that is at issue here. So as was previously marked as exhibit four, and the foundation for this, your honor, will be laid with our first witness. Um, the specific language of the operations manual at page two, paragraph five, is use of a product, including but not limited to pharmaceuticals, that do not carry FDA approval shall be considered experimental, investigational, and not reimbursable. That is the only provision of the operations manual that addresses reimbursement for pharmaceuticals. So if it is not FDA approved, as the language clearly says, then it's not reimbursable. The evidence will clearly show that the antidote used was FDA approved, that the, the denial basis articulated by SFG that the use of the drug in the manner in which it was used was not FDA approved is irrelevant because that's not part of the operations manual. The evidence will show through the testimony of Gotham Hospital's Vice President of Contracting and Revenue Cycle, Ms. Denise Ransdell, that the contract called for reimbursement of high cost drugs on an invoice pass through basis, meaning that the reimbursement for this drug is not adding to any profit margin that the hospital has. It's simply reimbursing the hospital for the cost of the drug that they put out. Uh, again, SFG paid nothing for the high cost drugs, even though all, as the evidence will show, all contractual appeal requirements were met um, and all requirements under the operations manual identified by SFG as the sole basis for the denial of payment were all met. Again, because the drug was FDA approved, it cannot be found to be experimental or investigational as the evidence will show. And we appreciate the opportunity to put this case before you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, counsel. Um, counsel for SFG Health Plan, do you have an opening statement you'd like to make? I do, Your Honor. Um, once more, I represent SFG Health Plan in the present arbitration. As counsel noted in his opening statement, the services rendered to this patient 
were in fact medically necessary. This is an eight day stay. Uh, this patient fortunately had a fall in her home and she required a total hip replacement. Um, the UBO4 was submitted to SFG uh, and it was processed in accordance with the contract between the parties. $90,000 was paid for the services rendered in this eight day stay for this patient. Uh, that's 90% of bill charges. That is the required reimbursement as set forth under the party's contract. As Mr. Levitch notes, there was in fact a high cost drug, a factor seven drug that was administered, that was denied. That drug was appropriately denied because while it is approved under the FDA for certain uses, its use as applied here in the present case is simply not approved by the FDA, thereby pursuant to the contract and the provider manual, which is incorporated expressly in the contract, the co I'm sorry, the factor seven is not payable. Again, as, as was noted and will be established through testimony here today, this was a seven figure um, price tag on this drug that was administered to this patient. And again, these are for a use which is not approved or authorized by the FDA. And for that reason, SFG Health Plan, pursuant to the contract and the provider manual incorporated therein, had good cause to deny the stay. Um, counsel for Gotham suggests, by virtue of the fact that the Factor 7 is FDA approved for certain purposes, means that it must be um, paid anytime it is administered, simply by virtue of the fact it is FDA approved. Candidly, that is a outrageous position. Um, pursuant to Gotham Hospital's articulation of the case at hand, um, Gotham Hospital would posit that if the Factor 7 was used in treating a patient who maybe had the flu, maybe unfortunately had COVID-19, if it was in fact administered simply by virtue of the fact that it was approved by the FDA, that is there, thereby payable pursuant to the terms of the contract. That's simply not how the contract reads. It's simply not how the provider manual reads. And thereby, the claim was adjudicated and processed properly by SFG Health Plan. And as will be established by the medical director who will be called during this arbitration, the service were appropriately denied is not medically necessary. Um, I strike that. the. The high cost drug factor seven was, a, was appropriately denied as not medically necessary. The remainder of the services rendered to a uh, patient all net were in fact paid uh, appropriately pursuant to the contract. All right. Thank you, counsel. Um, counsel for the, um, Gotham Hospital, are you ready to proceed with your case in chief? I am, Your Honor. Thank you. I'd like to call as my first witness Ms. Denise Ransdell. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Ms. Ransdell. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for testifying on behalf of Gotham Hospital today. Could you share with the arbitrator your healthcare employment history, please? Sure. Um, I started at Gotham Hospital in 1992 as a biller. Uh, then I moved to a department lead and was promoted to the director of contracting and now currently hold the director of contracting revenue cycle position. Thank you. Do you hold any professional certifications? I do. Um, CRCS, which is a certified revenue cycle specialist, a certification from AHAM. Great. And what is your current employment? I'm currently the VP of Contracting and Revenue Cycle at Gotham Hospital. Great. And could you summarize your current duties for the arbitrator, please? Sure. Um, I negotiate and maintain all hospital services contracts, develop, implement, and supervise the use of all revenue cycle workflow policies and procedures. And how long have you been employed in total with Gotham Hospital? For 30 years. Thank you. Who is the custodian of 
records with regard to the contracts at Gotham Hospital? I am. And do you, have you reviewed the contract involved in this case? I have. Okay, we've previously marked the contract as exhibit one. Who are the parties to the contract? Uh, Gotham Hospital and SFG Health Plan. And what is the effective date of the contract? October 1st, 2012 through September 30th, 2015. Thank you. And previously marked as exhibit two is the universal billing document referred to as the UB. Have you reviewed that document? I have. Great. And what was the patient's name that was treated? Charles Allnut. And what were the dates of service? November 11th through the 19th of 2013. Thank you. What are the total bill charges reflected on the UB? 1.4 million. And based upon those total bill charges, what is the contractual amount due? Uh, 1.4 million um, in invoice pass through. Great. And how much was paid by SFG or any other payer for the drug charges? Zero. Turning your attention to exhibit three, which is the appeal document. Are you familiar with that document? Yes, I am. And what is the date that the hospital appealed the denial? Uh, December 25th, 2013. And what is the contractual deadline for filing the appeal? Uh, January 25th, 2014. So the appeal was timely filed? Yes, it was. Okay. If I could turn your attention now to exhibit four, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen, hopefully. Yep, that didn't work. Please bear with me, Your Honor. I'm having a little difficulty with the previous document. It's the operations manual. Um, let me ask you, Ms. Ranzel, a couple of questions about the operations manual. Did Gotham have any input into the language included in the operations manual? No. And specifically, did Gotham have any input into the language used by SFG with regard to the provision of the operations manual addressing the requirements for reimbursement for high cost drugs? No. Thank you. I have no further questions, Ron. Right, thank you. Um, Cross? Council thank you, for, Your um, Honor. Health yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, good afternoon. Ms. Ransdell, um, your counsel focused your attention to the, the provider manual section. Um, did Gotham Hospital ever lodge any objections to the provider manual section that addresses um, coverage of, of, of pharmaceutical drugs? No. And isn't it true that Gotham Hospital was in fact provided notice of the um, provider manual um, as set forth by SFG Health Plan. Yes. Now as to the factor seven drugs which are at issue here today, did Gotham obtain authorization for the administration of the factor seven drugs uh, to patient all nut? No. Yeah. Why didn't the hospital um, obtain a, a prior authorization before administering a, a, a drug, which in fact costs in excess of $1 million? Well, it was an emergency um, care, so there was no need for authorization. In addition, the treatment was medically necessary, thus timely re retroactive authorization was sought to be sure. Now, Ms. Ransdell, would you agree that the manner in which the factor seven drug as it was administered in the present case was not authorized by the FDA? Objection, Your Honor, that calls for expert testimony from a lay witness. Thank you, counsel. Um, counsel for the health plan, do you have me come back to that before I make my ruling? Well, Your Honor, I would, I may take that up with the expert that um, Gotham Hospital intends to call here today, but I'd also say that as a, um, 
uh, a precipitate witness, Ms. Ransdell, um, may have knowledge as to whether or not the drug was um, approved by the FDA um, in the way in which it was administered to patient all night. Thank you, counsel. Um, counsel for the um, for the hospital, do you have anything um, else to say regarding what um, Mr. Haypack said before I make my ruling? Ms. Ransdell is the vice president of contracting and revenue cycle. She's not a medical professional. The testimony that counsel is seeking to elicit is much more appropriate to come from an expert witness. The concept of FDA approval is complex and is not something that should be inquired of by a lay, of a lay witness. All right, thank you. Um, I will rule that the objection is sustained. The witness will stop for testimony on that particular uh, question. Your Honor, at that, I have nothing further for Ms. Ramsdale at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramsdale. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lovers, do you have anything further with Ms. Ramsdale? No, I don't. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your time, Ms. Ramsdale. Mr. Lovers, do you have any, um, any further witness? I do. Um, Gotham Hospital would call Dr. Zarati as an expert witness. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Zarati. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming in and, and uh, testifying today. Uh, could you tell the arbitrator what your profession is? I'm an emergency room physician, Your Honor. Thank you. How long have you been a, an emergency room physician? 27 years. And please share with, with uh, the arbitrator your educational background. I received my doctorate degree from the University of California, Irvine College of Medicine. And when was that? 89. Great. Could you indicate to the arbitrator some specific training that you've had in your profession? Uh, from the College of Medicine, I went ahead and completed my residency program at UCI Medical Center. Uh, and then uh, went on to practice medicine in the community. Did you have, do you have some clinical experience as well? Treat, treating patients directly? That, that was the training, the residency training, treating patients. Very good. Do you have any experience in cases involving uh, hematology issues? Yes, it's not uncommon for emergency patients to have bleeding disorders. Yes. Right. And were you retained to render an opinion on the medical necessity of the treatment provided at Gotham Hospital to patient Charles Allnut? I was. Before you tell me your opinion, could you tell me what materials you reviewed in coming to your opinion on the medical necessity of the treatment? Yes, I reviewed the medical record for the patient, the Eliquis package insert, as well as the recombinant factor 7A package insert and some of the current literature on reversal agents for blood thinning medications. Thank you. And based on your training, education, and experience, also based on the materials you reviewed, did you form an opinion as to whether the treatment of Mr. Olnet was in fact medically necessary? Yes. Okay. Could you explain to the arbitrator what your opinion is in that regard, or the basis for your opinion? Sure. My opinion is that medical necessity was met because medical necessity is defined as services provided to a patient in the process of workup, diagnosis, or treatment that shows the clinician exercised prudent clinical judgment that was compliant with the standard of care. So from that perspective, I think medical necessity was met. The second is that if that treatment had not been provided to that patient, there would have been threat of limb loss and or life loss. The third is that the treatment was in compliance with the directions in the package insert of the recombinant factor 7A. Thank you. Doctor, could you? Provide an opinion with regard to the post-operative bleeding that led to the need for the antidote 
Is, is 10 units of hemoglobin a, a significant amount of bleeding? Yes, it is. Typically in a 70 kilogram individual, there are about five and a half liters and roughly uh, doing an equivalent of 10 units of blood is about five liters. So basically, as a comparison, the patient's blood volume was nearly replaced 100% major bleed. And having reviewed the medical records, would you classify the result of the treatment as successful? Yes, I would. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, no further questions at this time. Thank you, Council. Council for um, SFG Health Plan. Any questions for the witness? Yes, yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Girardi. Um, as you're probably aware, uh, I'm an attorney for SFG Health Plan in the present matter. Um, what did you do to prepare for your testimony today in the present case? I reviewed the medical record, the package inserts for both Eliquis and recombinant factor 7A, as well as some of the current literature on reversal agents for blood thinning medications. And, and who did you speak about, uh, I'm sorry, who did you speak with in regard to your uh, testimony uh, prior to today? Other than being asked to review the case, my only conversations uh, are here today. Now, are you aware that the only services um, or supplies that are actually in dispute uh, in regard to the treatment for patient ulnet are the high cost drugs, the, the factor 7A? Are you aware of that? Yes. That SFG is not clinically contesting the remainder of the services rendered to this patient during the eight day stay. Is that your understanding? Would you please repeat that? Yeah. You understand that in fact, SFG is not clinically contesting the remaining services that were rendered to patient all night during his eight day stay. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Now, isn't it true that the factor seven, the high cost drug at issue, was not approved by the FDA in the manner in which it was used in the present case. Yes. So would this be a off-label use for this high cost drug? Looking at the strict FDA recommendations, yes. Looking at the current literature, there is a place for it. I think it hasn't caught up with the FDA recommendations. Now you had referenced a, a package insert um, as to the factor seven. Uh, do you recall that testimony? Yes. Now is that package insert something that is approved by the FDA? Yes. So are you positing that in fact, because it's on a package insert that the way in which the factor seven was administered to this patient, it had approval by the FDA? The manner in which the drug was administered was in compliance with the package insert. The indications were not met. Now, have you reviewed the contract um, between SFG Health Plan and Gotham Hospital? I have not. And you're not offering an opinion specifically as to whether or not the factor seven would be payable pursuant to that contract. Is that correct? That's correct, because I haven't reviewed the contract. I have no further questions. I'll pass the witness. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Levich, any further um, questions to um, the doctor? Just a brief redirect, Your Honor, thank you. Doctor, I wanted to clarify the question that counsel had asked you with regard to the the lack of approval for use in the manner in which the product was used. I just want to make sure that the arbitrator understands, and you can uh, confirm this in my mind, that the lack of approval is not the equivalent of a rejection of approval. In other words, the FDA did not disapprove, but they did not approve the use. Is that a correct statement? Whoop, are we frozen? 
Oh, Doc, can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Go ahead okay. and try that again. There's a... Was there a delay? I didn't hear that completely. It broke out. Absolutely. Yeah, I apologize. I just wanted to clarify that when we say that the, the use of the drug and the manner in which it was used in this case was not approved by the FDA, that what that means is it was not necessarily rejected by the FDA for that use. It simply lacks the approval of the FDA. It's a, it's a uh, somewhat you know, thin difference, but I think it's important here. Is that an accurate statement? I would agree with that 100%. Thank you. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Um, anything further for the doctor, counsel? Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zerardi, um, Mr. Levich? Yes, thank you. Anything um, further? Yeah, we would move all of our exhibits into evidence that were pre-marked, pre and we would rest at this point, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Levich. Um, Council for SFG Health Plan, um, are you ready to bring on your witness? Yes, I will be calling the SFG Health Plan Medical Director, um, Dr. Right. Dr. X. I will be calling Dr. X the SFG Health Plan Medical Director. All right, um, Council, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, and Doctor. Look familiar to me. Dr. Um, Edaraz. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Edaraz. Um, good afternoon. What is your current job title at SFG Health Plan? I am the medical director for SFG Health Plan. And how long have you um, been the medical director at SFG Health Plan? 10 years. And what are your duties and responsibilities as the medical director at SFG Health Plan? My main duty is the oversight of utilization reviews. And, and when you say utilization reviews, can you um, elaborate that on that a bit for, um, for the arbitrator, please? Sure. I take a look at services provided to the patients as far as the medical necessity for the provision of those services. Now, have you reviewed the patient all net claim, which is at issue here today? Yes, I have. And are you aware that the issue as to the patient all net claim is whether the factor seven high cost drugs um, were in fact payable under the contract between SFG Health Plan and Gotham Hospital? Yes. And have you reached an opinion as to whether the high cost drugs were medically necessary in this case? Yes, I have. And, and based upon your, your training, education, and experience, um, what is the opinion that you have reached in regard to the factor seven drugs as administered in the present case? Considering the package insert that dictates that recombinant factor seven A is to be used with hemorrhaging involving hemophiliacs type A and Bs and acquire hemophilia, I would say that the use of this drug in this particular case, Mr. Charles Allnut was off-label and does not qualify. And, and, and therefore, um, would the drug be payable under the terms of the contract? It would not be payable because it was not used accordance, in accordance with the FDA approval recommendations or indications. Now, are you familiar with the, the provider manual between the parties? I am. And is your understanding based on the terms of the provider manual? Yes. I have nothing further at this time. I'll pass the witness to Mr. Lovich. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Lovich? 
Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Dr. Etaraz. How are you? I'm doing well. Great. We've never met before, have we? We have not. Okay, thank you. So you, uh, in response to counsel's question about the scope of duties that you have at SFG Medical, uh, I'm sorry, at S SFG uh, Healthcare, do your duties also include any input into the writing or drafting of the operations manual? Yes. And what input do you have in that regard? Making recommendations that mirror the FDA ad approvals as it pertains to medications. Did you write the provision in the operations manual with regard to identifying reimbursement that was previously shown in Exhibit 4? I did not. Okay. Were you involved in the drafting of the language that was used there? Yes. You were. And could you tell us what was the process that FSG went through in coming to a final decision on the language used in that provision? We considered the recommendations from the FDA as far as indication and dosages and we just determined that if used in compliance with the indications, it would be a paid drug. Great. And let, let me ask you the question in a little different way. I wasn't speaking necessarily with regard to the medical basis for it, but actually the practical drafting and um, implementation of the provision itself. So before a, a provision goes into the operations manual, is there significant discussion about the language used at SFG? Thank you for the clarification, Counselor. Yes, it is. Okay. And was there significant discussion and deliberations that went into the final wording of this particular provision? To the best of my recollection, there was. Okay. So the language that appears in the operations manual that is available to providers was the result of discussion and deliberation and reflects exactly what SFG intended it to reflect. Correct? That's correct. Was there any input into the language used solicited from Gotham Hospital before it was implemented? No. Was there any input solicited from any provider to that language that's used in the provision prior to it being implemented? No. Is it the practice of SFG not to consult with providers when articulating and drafting language for the operations manual? That's correct. Do you agree, doctor, that in the medical factual situation presented to the board certified hematologist that there was in fact no FDA approved antidote to the use of the blood thinning agent? Yes, I am aware. Okay. So is it your testimony then that in the face of the lack of an FDA approved antidote to the blood thinning agent, that the board certified hematologist's decision to use a drug that resulted in a successful result was incorrect? No. But I SFGs, would, I'm sorry, go ahead, doctor. I, didn't mean to I would you. say to that, that there are circumstances in medicine where decisions are made where medications are used off-label. Right, and this would be one of those circumstances, correct? That's correct. And the determining factor in that situation would be what is in the best interest of the patient, correct? Correct. And just a final question with regard to the operations manual, doctor. Is there any other requirement articulated in the operations manual for the reimbursement of uh, pharmaceuticals or drugs other than the drug itself has to have FDA approval? No, not at all. Thank, 
Thank you very much. No further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Council. Uh, Mr. Haypack, anything further? I have nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Do you have any other witnesses? Respondent rests, Your Honor. No other witnesses. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Lovich, anything further? Uh, just closing argument, Your Honor. Okay. <clears throat> so um, why don't you start your, um, your closing argument, your statement? Thank you very much, Your Honor. Let me start off by thanking uh, you, Madam Arbitrator, for your courtesy and, and uh, your agreement to serve as an arbitrator in this case. And I'd also like to thank counsel for his courtesies and cooperation throughout the handling of this, of this litigation. I think everybody would agree that the goal of healthcare is to reach a successful result, one that is aimed at and which accomplishes the best interest of the patient. As we also know, even as lay people, physicians are often faced with situations that are not completely planned out or that are historically provided to them and they have to rely upon their best medical judgment to meet those needs and, and serve the interests of the patient. I know that if I was in need of healthcare, I want my doctor's attitude to be, well, I. I need to come up with a way to treat this patient successfully. I'm not just gonna stand by and say, well, sorry, there isn't anything that's approved by the FDA that I can do for you. So either you're gonna lose your leg or you're gonna die. I uh, apologize for that, but that's the way it goes. It kind of reminds me of a story that, that I heard and it kind of really struck a note with me in terms of how people approach their professions and quite frankly, how they approach life in general. There was a, grammar school teacher who was teaching a group of seven-year-olds uh, in school, and she gave them an art project. And there was one little girl who typically didn't interact a lot with the other children in the, in the class. And she was sitting off to the side while she was drawing a picture. The teacher walked up to her and said to her, what are you drawing? And the little girl said, I'm drawing, I'm drawing the face of God. And the teacher said, but Jane, no one knows what God looks like. And the child looked at her and said, they will in a minute. That's the attitude I want from my physician if they're treating me for a condition that, it, that doesn't have a well-defined, completely approved treatment course. And that's what happened in this case. This physician, again, a board certified hematologist, was called upon to use his best judgment in treating Mr. Allnut. And his best judgment turned out to be the right judgment. For SFG then to rely upon language that does not appear in their operations manual to deny pass-through costs to the hospital is unconscionable. They are in complete control of the language of the operations manual. As testified to by their expert, their medical director, the language that was used in this, in this particular provision went through significant deliberations and discussions before it was communicated to the, to the uh, healthcare community. They were completely satisfied with the language that was included in that provision. Had they wanted to include language that indicated that not only does the drug have to be FDA approved, but it also has to be approved for the specific purpose that the drug is put to, they had every ability to do that. The only conclusion that we can come to based upon the medical director's testimony is that they considered that and they rejected it. And whether they did or they did not, it was not included in the language of that operations manual. They cannot be seen to come back now and say, well, what we really meant was it has to be FDA approved and approved for the purpose to which it was put. They can't do that. Because they're in complete control of that language, they live and die with the language. As a result, there's no conclusion that, that can be reached other than the fact that the hospital and the treating physician followed every requirement postulated by the operations manual. The doctor followed the manufacturer's instructions with regard to the administration of the drug. 
The fact that it's a high cost drug, and let me, let me quote counsel in his opening statement, a seven figure price tag for the patient is of no moment at all. SFG has a responsibility to compensate for whatever care is necessary to their subscribers. And they can't be seen now to come back and say, well, because this is a lot of money and because we failed to indicate that it's not reimbursable, but you kind of know what we mean. They can't be seen to walk away and not have to pay anything with regard to the, to the administration of these drugs. Um, Mr. Allnut was completely cured because of the treatment that was provided at Gotham Hospital. And as a result, I urge you, Your Honor, to find in favor of Gotham Hospital in the full amount of $1.4 million, again, a pass-through amount uh, that the hospital has already put out for those drugs. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Levitch. Mr. Haypack, do you have a closing statement to make? I do, Your Honor. And before I begin my, my closing argument, I would like to thank your honor for your time and consideration here today. I'd like to thank the, uh, the witnesses present as well as Mr. Lovich for his um, professional courtesy during this, um, this case. Now, I think we could all recognize that the services rendered to Mr. Allnet were in fact medically necessary. This was an eight day stay. And when you exclude the high cost drugs, um, the bill charges were $100,000. In fact, SFG paid $90,000 of that bill. SFG processed a claim as appropriate pursuant to the party's contract. Now, SFG and Gotham Hospital are both sophisticated parties. The contract itself incorporates expressly a provider manual, and that provider manual requires that for a drug to be payable, there must be FDA approval. Now, the, the, the crux and gravamen of Gotham Hospital's argument here today and Mr. Lovich's argument is that the, the term in the provider manual does not get specific as to the specific use or administration as, as to the drug. It just says if the drug must be FDA approved. Well, candidly, it's axiomatic that uh, uh, a drug that is FDA approved is approved for certain uses and, and thereby it's not approved for others. And unfortunately, in the case we have here today, the way in which the drug was administered to patient Allnut falls into the latter category, the category of uses in which the drug was not approved. Those are simply the facts of the case. Taken to its logical conclusion, the position of Gotham Hospital would lead to a uh, an untenable and absurd outcome. Presumably any drug that has um, an FDA approval would thereby be payable regardless of how it was used or administered um, by Gotham Hospital under the interpretation of Gotham Hospital's counsel in this matter. For example, we're all aware that we're unfortunately still in the throes of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. If, for example, a, a patient at Gotham Hospital were to be administered factor seven in some measure or in conjunction with treatment for COVID-19, um, presumably Mr. Lovich would posit that that drug is payable because factor seven does have some measure of FDA approval. Unfortunately, that's not what the contract Posits, that's not a reasonable interpretation of the provider manual. Once more, the obligations of both parties pursuant to the contract and provider manual are clear. SFG has a responsibility to reimburse Gotham Hospital for drugs that have the requisite FDA approval. And as a reasonable person would infer, that FDA approval would be for the use in which the drug was administered. Dr. Zerati, the expert for Gotham Hospital, noted that there may be literature that in fact may go to um, factor seven treatment for patients of this type. However, that literature has not been 
approved or evaluated by the FDA. Thereby, it is not compelling in the present case to the extent that it would require payment pursuant to this contract. And at that, um, I have nothing further. And um, if unless your honor has any questions of, of SFG health plan, uh, SFG rests. All right. Well, thank you counsel. Thank you for your courtesy today. Um, the evidentiary portion of this hearing is concluded, um, Your Honor. but the hearing, oh, Your I'm Honor. sorry, Mr. Levich. Do you have anything further? I do. I have a rebuttal statement as, as the plaintiff, I have the ability to rebut what counsel said. So I'll be brief and, and I appreciate the opportunity. Counsel talks about an untenable and absurd outcome through the use of, use of high cost drugs that do not fit within the, the language that counsel wishes were in the operations manual, but in fact is not. The only untenable and absurd outcome here would be if the patient had not survived and the patient did survive and the patient did have his leg saved because of the treatment that was provided. You can't rewrite the language of the operations manual just to avoid a large amount that is due to the hospital. And that's exactly what SFG is trying to do here. By retaining complete control over the language that's used in the operations manual, there's no room for reasonable inference with regard to the interpretation of that language. Council used the, the uh, term, any reasonable inference would include FDA approval for the use of the, of the product, but that's nowhere to be found in the operations manual. As we all know, the relationship between the parties is defined completely by the contract that they have agreed to between them. The contract incorporates by reference the operations manual, and the operations manual is in complete control of SFG. By using the language that they used, they have no ability now to come back and infer what they meant to include. And as a result, as previously indicated, reimbursement is completely indicated here. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Levitch. Um, Mr. Haypack, I'm assuming you have, do you have anything else? Not this time, Your Honor. Um, once more, SFG Health respectfully requests that uh, an award be um, issued I'm sorry, in its Your favor. Honor, excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry. I don't mean any disrespect to counsel. Counsel doesn't have an opportunity to re-rebut. To re counsel had a chance for a closing argument and I tip my cap to him and try and do extend the strike zone with regard to it. But your honor, I would strongly object to him being given an opportunity to re-rebut my, my rebuttal. Thank you. And, and Mr. Right, Lovich, I was just responding to a question respectfully that was um, asked of me of the arbitrator. But well, thank, thank you. you um, so we will conclude the evidentiary portion of this hearing. Uh, I will await for your closing briefs, and then about 30 days later, per our agreement, I'll submit my um, my decision. Um, if there's nothing further, then we're, thank you, and we're off the record. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us in the webinar. We wanted to reserve some time for questions and answers that kind of thing. Any questions that you have, if you want to do it through the chat, that would be great. If you don't, you could always go to our website and email us directly with any, with any questions that you have. One of the points that I wanted to, to emphasize is that for all of our provider clients that are listening or any providers that could potentially in the future become our clients, whenever we contact you and we ask you to be a witness in an arbitration, basically what we're looking for is exactly how Denise testified in this simulation. Those are the questions that we would ask. And we know that it can be a somewhat intimidating situation when you are sitting across from a lawyer and you've got a, a judge there and, and, and that type of thing. But really, there's nobody in that room that knows this area better than you do. So basically, the questions that we ask you are what you do on an everyday basis. So the, the feeling of being intimidated Hopefully we've
disabused you of that to a certain degree by showing you that it isn't as big a deal as, as you might conjure up in your mind with regard to the requirement to, uh, to testify. Um, anybody on the panel have any other further um, points that you wanna emphasize with regard to the arbitrations and the process and that type of thing? So let, let me just, I'm sorry, go ahead. One thing that we would be remiss by not mentioning is that uh, of the arbitrations that are filed, uh, the vast majority of them actually never get to the stage. Uh, the vast majority of arbitrations are actually resolved prior to it ever going behind closed doors for the actual arbitration. Uh, the, the, while an arbitration is filed, there's a, a continuing dialogue that exists between the parties in a hopes that they can uh, hopefully get a resolution to the dispute. Uh, so we did want to at least mention that, um, that just because there's a filing doesn't mean that it automatically will end up in this sort of formal uh, setting, uh, arbitration behind doors with an arbitrator. The vast majority of them are resolved prior to this stage. Right, Ex excellent point, Chuck. And, and it's, a, it's a good point to emphasize that our approach to handling the referrals that we get is to resolve the claims as efficiently and effectively as we can. So our goal is to do that at the earliest possible stage that we can, that we can do it. So as Chuck said, the vast majority of cases, even those that are filed, do not go to ultimately go to the arbitration hearing because we have ongoing settlement negotiations uh, with the other side to resolve it. You know, in litigation, I've been doing this for about 37 years. And, and what an axiom that has definitely proved true is that litigants in a civil matter give up almost complete control over the resolution of the case once they submit it to a third party. So you're better shot at getting more of what you want out of a case is to approach settlements or approach negotiations from um, a sense of compromise. Now, if you tell us that you want 100% of what you've referred to it, we are more than happy and willing to do that. And we'll take it all the way, whether it's in arbitration or it's in litigation. We are mindful of the fact that our effectiveness is judged not only on the recoveries that we obtain for you, but also on the efficiency of the handling of the claims. So we wanna find a point as early in the process as possible where we can provide you with a resolution route. Um, and so that's why we contact you for certain documents. That's why we provide you with uh, 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 letters of recommendation with regard to what the settlement value is and that kind of thing. But I just wanted to emphasize that even though you refer the cases to us, and as Chuck said earlier, we don't file anything without your written express consent. And at no point in the process are we in, in complete control over the amount that is accepted or how the case is, is resolved. That's completely up to you. We come back to you to get settlement author authority before we can accept any kind of settlement offer. So you remain driving the bus throughout the entire uh, uh, process in that regard. So anybody else have any, have any input? I'm looking at like the Brady Bunch picture here. Dr. Girardi is Mike, right? And I'm not sure who I would be at the top square. If it was Hollywood Squares, I think I'm Rosemary, but I'm not sure how, <laughs> how that would work. Anyway, I think we're, unless somebody has questions through the chat, we, we really do appreciate everybody participating in this. And we're gonna do this on, a, on an ongoing basis. We'll come up with other topics, com, come up with uh, other ways of showing you what we do. Um, Okay, great. I thought we had a question, but thank you very much, Julie, for your kind comments there. Again, um, please contact us if you have any questions about anything related to healthcare. Um, we, we are anxious to answer any questions that you have and to provide any service that we can provide to you. So again, use your Uber Eats voucher, have a nice lunch, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much.